If rubber trees were indigenous to the U.S., then maybe we don't get one of the world's most classic playthings. And if the chemical reaction that followed this product doesn't ripple across Toyland, then maybe we don't have toy aisles oozing with compounds today. After this compound came Play-Doh, slime, floam, pluffle, thinking putty. Sure, there's goo and there's glup and they're great, but nothing else is silly putty. As World War II dragged on, our ability to get natural rubber to make essential items like Jeep tires, gas masks, and boots was crippled. The U.S. government's War Production Board asked American chemical companies to come up with rubber we could make in a lab. James Wright, a chemical engineer working in General Electric's New Haven, Connecticut laboratory, took up the challenge. Wright tried numerous chemical compounds, and when he mixed silicone oil and boric acid in a test tube, he was surprised to find that they polymerized. He removed the gummy substance from his test tube, and in a desire to test any rubber-like properties it might have, threw it on the floor. He named it Bouncing Putty. Wright discovered that despite its bounding properties, this putty did not make a synthetic rubber. It was way too soft and under intense pressure would shatter. Still, GE thought it might have some application. So while Wright applied for the patent, GE executives sent it off to engineers around the world to find out what it could be used for. So is it a liquid or a solid? Well, technically speaking, it's a non-Newtonian fluid because it does not follow Newton's laws of viscosity. It contains long molecules called polymers, which slide over one another and allow it to flow like a liquid. However, those long molecules are linked. So if rapid force is applied to them, they become entangled and it allows the putty to act like an elastic solid. If extreme rapid force is applied to them, those molecules link even further and it'll break apart like a solid. And that is why a ball of this putty will settle into a tired puddle if left alone, bounce if thrown on the ground, and shatter if struck with a hammer. In the world of toys, there's legend and then there's the actual truth, which is always more entangled and a lot more interesting. The story goes that GE executives pondered the putty for five years and then came out with the verdict. No practical use. The real story is a lot more interesting. As early as 1944, GE was promoting all the things that bouncing putty could do and would do once the war was over. This silicone product data sheet provided numerous practical uses for bouncing putty, including use as a damping agent, a sealing and filling compound, and yes, even use as a novelty item. In 1948, they decided it could be put inside a golf ball. As GE tried to find a practical use for their putty, the putty found a following as a cocktail party fad all around the New Haven, Connecticut laboratory where it was discovered. In the late 1940s, a marketer and copywriter by the name of Peter Hodgson was hired by a woman named Ruth Fallgator. Ruth owned a toy store and she was introduced to the putty at a party by a friend of hers who was a GE executive. In 1949, Ruth Fallgator began selling bouncing putty from her store, the Block Shop in New Haven, Connecticut, and more significantly from her very successful mail order catalog, which was mailed all over southern New England. At first, she offered bouncing putty as an adult stress relief toy in a clear case for $2. Peter Hodgson helped write the copy for the catalog. Another tall tale you'll often hear regarding this toy's history is the fact that despite its moderate success, Ruth Fallgator decided to abandon the putty and brave Peter Hodgson decided to carry on. Even though he was $112 in debt, he borrowed $147 and struck a deal with GE and the rest 
is history. It sounds good, but the truth is Ruth continued to sell the putty too, now buying it from Hodgson, and it appeared in her yearly catalog from 1949 to as late as 1955, and she enlisted Romney Gay, the children's book author and illustrator, to draw one of his cute kid characters playing with the stuff. And while it may be true that Peter Hodgson struck a deal with GE in 1950, so did a lot of other people. General Electric made the putty for just about anyone who wanted to try to sell the stuff. They made it for a company called S.R. Glittens, who sold it for exercising hands, fingers, and arms. A company called George C. Bishop sold it for the same purpose. That same year, a man named David R. Blake started selling it as a way to level wobbly furniture, and a couple started selling it to solve the very same problem at the very same time. Hodgson changed the name of his putty to Silly Putty, because if he couldn't own the exclusive right to the product, he could at least own the name. Plus, it spoke to all the silly antics that this stuff did. It did way more than bounce. It could stretch like taffy, and when pressed flat, could copy the print off of a comic book or funnies page. His next stroke of genius was to come up with a package that set his product apart. For no other reason than the fact that Easter was right around the corner, he hit upon the idea of selling Silly Putty in a dual-colored, egg-shaped container. And the silliness of Silly Putty was cemented in consumers' minds. The world was introduced to Silly Putty by the dozen, inside pasteboard egg cartons at the 1950 International Toy Fair in New York. Hodgson's big break came when he convinced Doubleday stores to carry his eggs by the dozen, as seen in this photo from a Doubleday store in St. Louis, where the fad took off and spread to other Doubleday stores. In the summer of 1950, a writer from the New Yorker stumbled upon Silly Putty at a Doubleday store in Manhattan, and then featured it in the popular column Talk of the Town. After the issue hit the stands, Silly Putty marketing was inundated with phone calls. They reportedly took orders for 250,000 eggs of Silly Putty. Picking comics off a page and stretching faces into silly contortions was a kid favorite beginning in the 1950s. Today's printing inks won't allow Silly Putty to do one of its most memorable tricks. But if you get an old comic like this one, you can relive some of your childhood silliness. Hey! Hey! It's Silly Putty time! In the early 1950s, Hodgson began advertising Silly Putty on TV's Captain Kangaroo and the Howdy Doody Show. It was one of the first TV advertised toy items after Mr. Potato Head, and Silly Putty marketing was shrewd in their package execution. To reinforce Silly Putty's TV connection, the first packages from the 1950s actually look like a TV screen, complete with knobs, as if to say, hey kids, this is the stuff you saw on television. Peter Hodgson, the copywriter, really spoke to kids in his advertising, literally. Here's the man himself as a globe-trotting captain in a very slow-paced ad from the 1950s. Hello there. You know, I've been all around this wonderful world of ours, and in all of this world, nothing else is silly putty. What is silly putty? Well, it's a real solid liquid. If you pull it so, it'll go forever, like taffy. But if you give it a sharp tug, it'll break like a biscuit. Now, when you make silly putty round, and drop it. It'll bounce higher than a rubber ball. And here's something else you can do with Silly Putty. Flatten it, press a picture in your newspaper, lift it, stretch it this way and that, and you'll get something that's really funny. Always put your Silly Putty back in its egg or it will run slowly away. The 1960s were very good to Silly Putty. All of Peter Hodgson's eggs were in one basket. His company, Silly Putty Marketing, never made another product, and yet when he passed away in 1976, he left an estate worth an estimated $150 million. One year later, the rights to Silly Putty were purchased by Crayola crayon maker Binny & Smith. 
300 million eggs have rolled off the assembly line since that fateful day in 1943. This strange silicone polymer still suffers from a liquid-solid identity crisis, but we've never failed to identify its most crucial chemical component. Fun. Thank you for watching. Please consider liking this video, subscribing to this channel, and hitting that notification bell so you never miss the fun. What classic toy would you like me to cover next? Let me know in the comments below. Until next time, seize the play.